completing the reset button last year and building our way up to the Bronze Age so far, I've now covered and attempted to recreate many significant aspects of human development that allowed the construction and organization of larger and more complex civilizations. Agriculture, metallurgy, the wheel, written language, and math. However, when neighboring civilizations begin to grow and compete over limited resources, conflict becomes inevitable, most famously in the Mediterranean. And as we begin to reach the end of the Bronze Age, war evolved into new levels of complexity thanks to all these technological advancements, which in the end may have helped cause a collapse of many of these societies, inadvertently setting the stage for the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. So today, we're going to explore and recreate what may have been the tools that brought this change, the weapons of war the legendary warriors like Achilles might have used, and learn how to actually fight with them. Everything we use comes from 8,000 generations of collective innovation and discovery. But could an average person figure it all out themselves and work their way from the Stone Age to today? That's the question we're exploring. Each week, I try to take that next step forward in human history. My name is Andy, and this is How to Make Everything. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next step in this journey. The exact causes of the Bronze Age collapse are mostly unknown and remain highly debated. But sometime around the year 1200 BCE and within a short span, multiple neighboring civilizations in the Mediterranean all collapsed. And those that didn't collapse were greatly weakened. Trade routes were disrupted, cultures were destroyed, and writing systems forgotten. Theories of the cause range from environmental factors like droughts and volcanoes, foreign invaders, or most likely a combination of factors that pushed all these civilizations past their breaking points and caused a general systems collapse. One common theory that likely was at least a significant contributing factor was the advancement in warfare, which led to numerous expensive and straining wars that might have pushed empires like the Greek Mycenaeans to collapse. One such significant war was documented in what is considered by some to be the very first Western work of literature, the Iliad, written by Homer 500 years after the event. It tells the story of a supposed 10-year siege of Troy by a combined Greek Mycenaean army, including the fabled Achilles. The epic makes no attempt at historical accuracy and characters like gods are prominent characters in it, so it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. However, archaeological evidence of the location of the city of Troy has been pretty much confirmed and potentially aligned to the dates of the legend, placing the battle sometime around 1250 to 1225 BCE. To better understand the weapons used in this famous war, I'm going to attempt to recreate some, potentially that Achilles himself may have used. The archaeological evidence from the ruins where the battle possibly took place give a variety of examples of different weapons that were used in this era. So for some help casting them, I paid a visit to Greg, the sword casting guy, in Austin, Texas. Uh, it didn't go quite into the wings and it didn't go quite down here. I think our next attempt will get it. The attempt at the Mycenaean sword didn't quite fully cast, so we tried a second attempt. Greg also added some channels to help assist the bronze getting fully into the handle. That I think it worked great. Got all of it this time? I think so. Well, yes. Nice. Yes. Worked just right. The type of sword we cast is known as Type G, and Greg's friend Mike provided us with a mold of it and a little context behind the sword. 
I got this uh, casting from a guy named Neil Burridge in the UK, and it was found in Greece originally from the Mycenaeans. I think everybody would have the sword, or it'd be uh, a few other varieties too. They had a lot of swords of different shapes, but all of them shared a lot of similarities. Very pointed, they had these crescent-shaped pommels, a rib going down the middle, or sometimes multiples. The Mycenaean ones tended to be very, you know, spiky and stabby. They all had this one theme, which was to get through armor. So they were all very pointy and direct. So that's why they're so different from like a Kopesh or other Bronze Age swords, because they had a different purpose. So you worked with the Kopesh earlier today, which is a weapon from the Levant. It's a weapon designed to slash. And slashing is good and all, but if you're fighting people with armor, it becomes much less effective. Even leather can stop a blade very easily, especially when it's made of bronze, not something like steel. And when you hold this, you're gonna figure out pretty quickly, it's not really meant for anything but stabbing essentially a spear sidearm. Their primary weapon was the spear and the shield. They had a couple shield designs, but they were all designed to be used interlocking, and you would kind of poke out and stab from behind the shield. It was very effective, and it seems like they were professional soldiers. And, you know, based on Homer and the Iliad, they sure seemed like it. So if Achilles was a, a real person, this is a sword he probably would have been using? Probably, something like it. Uh, he would have used the spear first, and then if that had broken, he would have pulled out a sword as a sidearm. With the spearhead and sword now successfully cast, the next step is to strengthen the cutting edge on both of them by work hunting them by hitting them with my hammer on the anvil. A nice and noisy process, but thanks to today's sponsor of Cove, I don't have to hear it. Cove, noise canceling Bluetooth headphones are designed to cradle your ears like they are, well, a Cove. The memory foam ear cushions are soft and form fitting, and 4.1 audio with noise canceling surrounds your ears in clean, clear sound. They're easy to take with you with up to 12 hours use time or 200 hours of standby. A built-in mic also means you can use it for video chat or phone calls. If you want to use a hardline, it also comes with an auxiliary 3.5 millimeter connection. Right now, if you use a discount code in the description, Cove will give you 67% off the normal retail price for these headphones. That's only $67 instead of the 199. Just use the code HTME67 in checkout to get your discount. Now to find a pole for the spear shaft. The length of Mycenaean spears varied in the Bronze Age. Early on, they were long two-handed weapons around 10 feet or 3 meters and were used with a large full-height shield slung over the neck. But late into the Bronze Age, they switched to shorter one-handed spears, usually around 6 feet or 2 meters, used in connection with a smaller circular shield. Fine. Give that a shot. Timber. To help straighten the pole a little more, I'll heat the bends over a fire and apply a little pressure to bend it back. Now to attach the spearhead, which has convenient holes, allowing you to tie it directly to the shaft.
for the sword. Now that these weapons have been made, let's learn how they'd actually be used in combat, thanks to Demon Stith. Featured on shows like History's Deadliest Weapons, Demon teaches lessons on African martial arts and runs Street Forge Armory, which makes historical, cultural, tactical, and speculative weapons for martial arts, stage, screen, and cosplay. He previously gave me some training with a Kopesh, an Egyptian style of short sword, but I also wanted to learn how you'd fight using the primary weapon of the Bronze Age, the spear. We've talked about the Kopesh and the mystique that surrounds it. Now let's talk about the true workhorse of the battlefield, which is the spear. So this right here is a, this is a stick. <laughs> Before you had fancy, you know, tools and stuff like that, the stick would serve as a way to, to train for other weapons. The Egyptians practiced at least uh, four different modalities of stick fighting. Two-handed stick, stick and shield, single stick, double stick, and then a subcategory of the two-handed stick is uh, using these long punting poles in a primarily thrusting capacity. And you see this practice in the Egyptian combat sport of water jousting. Object of the game, use your punting pole in order to knock the other opponents off the rafts. When they're using these punting poles like spears, so you see them in these positions, it's easy for me to transition my hands from this type of position to this type of position to get a real powerful long thrust or for here where I can just throw it out like a javelin. Grab you a stick real quick and we're just gonna go through some of the defensive movements. For defense, all we would do is use like lateral motions to kind of offset the thrust of the prod so he gives me an attack and I clear from here. If you go up higher to like the header to the, mm -hmm, and I clear. And so each time you can see as our ships get closer to each other, when we get this like defensive bonding, the sticks are being dropped, they close in for grappling. Again, this is associated with fishermen. So throwing the spear out from here, you can transition here where I can cast the spear out from there. I can reinforce and I can hit, hit, or from here I can cast it into the shield. If you have both hands, on your weapon and your main source of, of protective gear is your shield, it makes it hard to use. The most common configuration, of course, shield and spear. This position here was probably more common. I can close behind, I can thrust down over shields. From range, I can throw this, close in. But if I'm fighting in my shield wall, a person to person, I'll go into this position here. If I go straight for his leg, he'll move it or he'll drop it, right? So what I really wanna do is I wanna threaten his vision. So I may thrust to the eyes and then send my next strike into the leg, okay? Or I may come around, close in, and I step around and hit. I'm trying to probe around and get him to move this and open up exposed areas. Now, if he were to use this shield here, it's less coverage for him, but he's gonna be a little more maneuverable and he won't lose visibility as easy. We come in, I'm still trying to deal with his sword, but I have the range where I can just cast this out and pop those targets. Choke in, come in close, and then we're going around. So yeah, this is uh, simple stuff. By the end of the Bronze Age, one of the new challenges facing warriors was the addition of bronze armor. Larger, wealthier civilizations were able to start producing. I'm hoping to start building my own body armor a little later on, but while in Austin, we met with Matt, who was able to show us some of the types of armor soldiers would be protected by and be up against in this era. My name is Matt Poitras. I'm an armor smith and a leather craftsman. I've been doing it about 20 something years. Uh, my business is called Empty Filmcraft, and you can find me on Instagram under Mr. Filmcraft. This is possibly the armor Achilles might have been wearing? Yeah, sure, it could have been. Yeah, if Achilles was real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I made this bronze age set uh, about five years ago. It's a uh, Mycenaean, Achaean, which would have been worn like by the warriors at Troy. Bronze plates are actually based on finds from the time period. Various bronze plates that they found that had holes in there, in the edges that were basically attached to a perishable material like linen or, or leather. Um, this leather is about a quarter inch thick, so it's quite thick. I really killed my hands making the set. Of course, the leather didn't survive the you know three three thousand plus years mm. old it is, but the bronze does. The helmet is actually not a bronze age; it's a, a later period Scythian helmet. I typically do Bortesque helmet with this setup right here, which is a complex, difficult helmet to put together. It requires just tons of handwork. That's a very common type of armor that was used. That one is a, a scale set from a later period, it's Iron Age. I think the Egyptians were the first to actually to actually use it, and they used plates that were a little bit. 
bigger than that, made out of bronze, and they had like a raised ridge on them. Persians would wear that, Scythians would wear that, Greeks would wear it. Vikings may have even had access to it through Byzantine up until uh, the Crusades. And one of my favorites to make, actually. The scales are actually just stitched on and banded together with rows of leather. So it's actually going through like three layers here. How much does this one weigh? Uh, I think that one's about 16, 17 pounds. How much does this one weigh? This one's like a good, maybe 25 pounds. Okay. It's, it's quite heavy, it's quite cumbersome. You can't move a whole lot in it. Can I try it on? Sure. From the side. There you go. Typically on armor from that time, it only opened on the left-hand side, which was the shield side, so you're kind of doubled up in protection there. <laughs> Here's a bronze sword. Now to take everything I learned and put it to use. It's time for war. And let's see if my civilization will face an imminent collapse. As a smiter, you've captured this foe and you're demonstrating your dominance over them and you have the rays over here. Mm. It's time for war! Okay, so here I have the completed spear and sword. And I also have a, a remote idea of how to actually fight with them. So all these specific weapons didn't actually cause the end of the Bronze Age. It was the production methods that allowed them to be mass produced and deployed in larger numbers it was likely a contributing factor to the actual Bronze Age collapse. Fortunately, I don't have anyone to declare war on, so I think my civilization might be fine. So my hand is enforced and war is upon us. So we have some armored opponents, see how all the weapons can handle it. And the new assistant to Lauren, initiating her in this process with war. I'm sorry, friends. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Were you expecting that? For me to be such a good stabber? <laughs> yeah. Oh! Ah. Oh! <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> ah. Wow, good job, Andy. <laughs> All right, so we tried it against leather and rawhide, and neither really proved much resistance. Next up, I got some bronze. Let's see if that does any better. Oh. Hey, pierced it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Watch out, Andy. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> we have been victorious. Victory has never tasted so sweet. All right, so we've managed to vanquish our foes. Weapons seem to be pretty effective. Had a little resistance against the armor, but we're able to work around that. And uh, our enemy has been vanquished. <laughs> Whether this sword and spear contributed to the collapse of the Bronze Age world or not, Around 1200 BCE, many formerly great empires dissolved and left a period of Dark Ages behind. One theory is that this disruption of established trade routes that originally opened the door for the invention of the alloy of bronze, once it stabilized, forced people to find a more plentiful and local metal to replace it, iron. There's not exactly a ton of evidence to support this theory, however, it was worth noting that this all just happened in one area of the world. Other regions like South Asia and China relatively seamlessly transitioned from their Bronze Age into the Iron Age. 
this whole culture just kind of collapsed. Or the sea people? Yeah. So the sea people were talked about by the Egyptians as like this force that came and destroyed everything. And there's records from all over the Near East right before a dark age started of these mysterious sea people. There's this creepy letter that was found, like a clay tablet that was found in the kiln. And it was written from one king to another asking for help. They talked to each other like they were father and son or more siblings. It was that that's how the royals did it. it. Said my father behold the enemy's ships came here. My cities were burned and they did evil things in my country. Does not my father know that all of my troops and chariots are in the land of Hatti, which is the Hittites, and all my ships are in the land of Luca. Thus the country is abandoned to itself. May my father know it the seven ships of the enemy that came have inflicted much damage upon us. And that was found unsent. That's how the end came to the Bronze Age. The sea people were referenced by the Egyptians uh, as the end of the Bronze Age. The Egyptians had these very boastful inscriptions about we defeated the sea people, killed them in our harbor, and their souls are in the underworld now. But when you actually look at pictures of the sea people that they drew, there were soldiers, and then there were like civilians and cattle and wheat. So it looks like they were refugees. And given that there were records of drought and records of you know, administrative problems, it might have just been that the sea people were a symptom of sort of a growing crisis. So there was this system collapse, as they call it, where the Bronze Age world, which was based on trade and interconnectedness and diplomacy and war, fell apart and things went into a dark age. And afterwards, we come out with iron weapons in the classical Greek world. But it all kind of ended with something like this. I mean, you can give it a shot. We use for stabbing. Right, you kind of get the point. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.